Hello and thank you for joining us. In this presentation, we are going to be talking about the various physical infrastructure technologies available to you. Now, you may be wondering, why should I watch this video? Well, here are a couple of questions to help you get to that answer. 1. Do you want to better understand the differences between traditional, converged, and hyperconverged offerings? 2. Are you looking to evaluate these technologies in a normalized way? 3. Are you looking to deploy a more open infrastructure that is cloud ready so that you are not locked into one particular vendor? If you answered yes to these questions, it probably makes sense to watch this video. So let's get started. Before we talk about the various options, we should probably define a few terms. Different vendors use the same words to mean different things. So for the purposes of this video, when we use the word traditional, we mean that the compute, storage, and network components of the solution are physically distinct and managed separately from each other. When we use the word virtual, we mean that one or more of the components has been abstracted by software from its physical components. The most common virtual deployments are in the compute stack, but storage and network virtualization have also gained traction in recent years. When we use the word converged, we mean that the compute, network, and storage are still physically discrete components, but they're all managed from a single point. As you will see, these technologies may or may not be from a single vendor. When we use the word hyperconverged, we mean that the compute and storage have been collapsed into a single offering. Some vendors also include networking components, whereas others leave that to the end user. Software-defined storage is a phrase you will usually hear when vendors discuss their hyperconverged offerings. One other word you sometimes hear when discussing your infrastructure is containers. Although this is not technically a word I would use when talking about physical infrastructure, it bears defining anyway. A container takes the concept of a virtual server and shrinks it down into just the software you need to run a discrete service. Instead of deploying an OS, such as Windows or Linux, into a virtual machine and then installing your application into that VM, instead you package your workload into a container with just the prerequisites it needs to run. This is discrete packaging and sometimes referred to as microservices. It's a great architecture when discussing workload mobility between your data center and the cloud, but we'll not be spending too much time on it here in this video. First, let's take a look at traditional infrastructure. In this topology, your compute, storage, and networking environments are distinct entities. Sometimes the storage resides within the servers themselves, but it's still considered traditional because the disks within each server are not pooled and are not managed centrally. One of the benefits of this kind of environment is that you get to pick the vendor of your choice for each tier. In this example, we see HP servers, IBM storage, and Cisco networking. If this customer chooses to change the server vendor, they could do so without any other disruption to the environment. Another benefit is that each tier is independently scalable. I can add capacity to my storage array or add servers to my compute stack without having to impact the rest of the environment or take any systems offline. A third benefit is that since I'm using an open set of technologies rather than a validated configuration, there are a few constraints as to the solutions I can deploy on this hardware. Some downsides to a traditional deployment is that it can take up more physical space, it can be more costly, and repurposing components for other workloads may be cumbersome. You can mitigate these disadvantages in two primary ways, form factor and virtualization. Form factor changes have seen data centers collapse standard rack servers into blades, internal storage collapsed into larger, more robust disk arrays, and networks re-architected for data locality. These technologies help solve some of the management and capacity planning concerns. Virtualization is widely utilized to mitigate the amount of hardware you need to deploy. It has the added benefit of increasing your operational efficiency by utilizing centralized management and allows for utilizing more of the capacity that you do have deployed. In this example, we could virtualize the servers by adding VMware, the network with Cisco's NSX offering, and the storage using IBM SVC. The downside to this approach is the added cost and overhead of the virtualization technology, which may be one of the reasons we're starting to see a renaissance in traditional purpose-built architectures. In a converged infrastructure, the compute, storage, and networking is all controlled via a single management interface. Just because the tiers have been brought together, this does not mean that all components need to be from a single vendor. A good example of this is Cisco's approach to converged. As Cisco does not have its own storage practice, 
they partner with others to deliver pre-validated and centrally managed systems. Offerings like vBlock using EMC, VersaStack using IBM, or FlexPod using NetApp Storage are good examples of this. In this picture we see a VersaStack. It contains dedicated Cisco switching and blade servers, along with IBM Flash Storage. Remember, the key to Converge is that these are all managed and maintained from a single interface. When a support ticket is opened, the vendors will work with each other for resolution rather than point the end user to the storage vendor or the server vendor. A downside to this type of offering is that there are limits as to what components you can utilize. They need to be validated to work within the solution. In the last few years, hyperconverged has become a huge buzzword in the industry. Some vendors would position hyperconverged as the natural next step in the evolution of the data center. They'll say that traditional was the old way of thinking. Converged is more advanced, and hyperconverged is more advanced still. Let's take a look at the architecture to see if that claim holds up. The primary offerings in this space are Nutanix, a software company that partners with Lenovo, Dell, or Supermicro to deliver their solution as an appliance. Simplivity, who was purchased by HP Enterprise and uses specialty hardware and software to achieve its goals. And Hyperflex, which is an offering by Cisco. VMware would also say that by using its software stack with your existing hardware, you are creating a hyperconverged environment. All these vendors rely on software-defined storage. They use inexpensive local disk within the individual servers and create a common pool over the network. This disk is usually a combination of high-speed solid state, used for disk pooling and caching, and then a much larger set of disks that are rotational. Multiple copies of all data is made across the nodes, but technologies such as compression and deduplication help mitigate the space taken up by these extra copies. This entire approach can help drive down the cost of your environment. The pros to a hyperconverged environment are that it's centrally managed, it's highly scalable, it's high performing within its caching envelope, and that it can, in certain circumstances, save on overall cost of ownership. The downsides are that you can only run the software the vendors have certified, and some solutions you need to expand your storage footprint even if you just need more servers or vice versa. If you overrun the disk caching mechanism, your performance will be unacceptable, and there's a cost and overhead associated with the hyperconverged software itself. Trying to compare solutions can be difficult, especially when you are looking at the different topologies that we've been discussing in this video. Here are a few tips to help you make your decision. Networking. Many network vendors leave the network components out of their solution entirely. Make sure you have a clear understanding of the bandwidth, latency, and cost requirements, and get an understanding from the vendor how they will help you support the environment in case of issues. Disk capacity. Traditional technologies would use disk striping for data protection, for instance RAID 5 or RAID 6. Some newer solutions rely on making several copies of the data in multiple locations. Never compare the amount of raw disk space when evaluating solutions. A 90 terabyte traditional array might net 70 terabytes of usable space. A 90 terabyte hyperconverged array might only net 30 terabytes of usable space. Vendors mitigate this by adding compression, deduplication, and other technologies. When you hear expected usable disk, be wary, and always ask if the vendor provides guarantees and what actual usable space you'll have after deduping compression. Compute and memory. With some solutions, especially hyperconverged, a piece of each server is used to run the hyperconverged software. In most cases, SimpliVity being the notable exception, this software also runs the compression and deduplication we just discussed. This can cause significant overhead to the individual nodes. Never take the face value of the number of cores and total RAM when evaluating different solutions. Always ask how much CPU and RAM you can actually allocate to your virtual machines. Management. Studies have shown that the operational cost of any system is many times the money spent in acquisition. Make sure you understand how the new environment will be managed. Will you be able to use a single tool or do you have to use multiple? How will the vendors interact with the parts of the solution that don't belong to them? Scalability. You can evaluate the initial cost of different systems against each other, but always understand what happens when you grow. Does a 10% increase in capacity six months from now equate to spending 10 or 15% of the initial price, or is it more like 30 or 40%? Is there a limit to the number of servers, number of drives, etc., that you can deploy? Ask if you can attach other solutions, such as external disk arrays, to your new infrastructure. 
always make sure there's a path for growth in any solution you deploy. So what did we see? We saw the differences between traditional, converged, and hyper-converged offerings. We saw the way in which these offerings can be normalized, that they can be evaluated side by side. And we saw how making smart infrastructure choices, you could deploy a more open infrastructure so you're not locked into one particular vendor. So I hope you enjoyed this presentation, and feel free to reach out to us so we can help you like we help our other clients.